For the first speaker, we have one of WA's iconic leader in rural health, Aboriginal health, and also international health. He is the Foundation Professor of General Practice at UWA, Special, uh, Specialist Advisor to the House of Representatives, Standing Committee on Aboriginal Health. He's also provided medical assistance overseas, specifically in crisis areas such as East Timor. He's also a member of the Order of Australia and is an honorary research fellow at UWA. He is also a Royal Australian College uh, of General Practitioner, Corliss Travelling Fellow, and WA Faculty of the Royal College as well. He's also chaired the Parliamentary Report, uh, termed the Cayman Report, and, and that has led to the creation of WA Centre of Remote and Rural Medicine and the country, the country Medical Foundation. Please give a warm welcome for Emeritus Professor Max Cayman. It's very nice of you to um, invite me. Uh, old blokes live longer if they mix with younger people. And uh, it doesn't seem very long ago that uh, I was a medical student. Um, the next speaker was actually a student of mine. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a bit of a, a personal story. It's a bit like a travel log. Uh, and I'm going to tell you uh, where I went and uh, how I came to go there and what I learnt there and uh, you will see how you will find your way around to go to places that you want to go. Aha. It doesn't work already. Hey. <laughs> now it does. Uh, my, my background was that I was born in Perth but I came from migrant uh, family, so I, I was aware of people from other places in the world, and most of my parents' friends came from other places in the world. In the days when I was a medical student, we had to go to Adelaide, uh, because there was no medical school here, and that was one of the better things that happened to me, because I resided in a place called Lincoln College, which, which uh, was an international college. I learned to cook a reasonable curry and uh, met lots of people from Southeast Asia who to this day are still my friends. <coughs> uh, so I, did a, I graduated and I did a year in Fremantle Hospital and a year in the Melbourne Children's Hospital and uh, I then took off and I went to New Guinea. Uh, this was a very common place to go to uh, for Australian people. And the first place they sent me to in New Guinea was a place called Saiho. And when I got there, uh, a nurse met me at the plane and told me that uh, there were two caesarean sections and a ten-year-old boy who had a ruptured spleen and they were waiting for me to deal with them. <coughs> uh, as I walked in then, the, this crowd of orderlies was all waiting, standing at attention. Uh, this became, uh, I'm fairly egalitarian and I, I couldn't stand this, but every morning they would line up for inspection. And try as I might, I couldn't get them to stop doing that. Uh, the children, uh, as you'll see, uh, had protein malnutrition, uh, some of them looked like this because they had intestinal parasites, also huge spleens from malaria. And I made friends with the, uh, the patrol officer uh, who was related to Professor Dick Josky, who uh, was the professor of medicine here. <coughs> and Saiho was set up uh, at a volcano. The volcano went off in 1953 and it went off sideways and it killed uh, 3,000 people. And that's not bad going in a very sparsely populated area. And the only people who survived were the elderly people, and they couldn't run, so they stayed in their huts. And what killed them was the, the blast of hot air, which uh, <clears throat> reached 200 degrees centigrade and stayed like that for a couple of minutes and basically cooked their lungs. Uh, when you climb up there, uh, it's quite warm. Uh, while I was up there, I was woken at 3 o'clock one morning uh, and I, there was about 30 people 
and they were making a hell of a noise and they wanted a beer and luckily I had enough beer to go around. Um, and they told me <coughs> that they had a meeting, uh, they were, uh, it was an independence meeting, and at the meeting they decided that they weren't going to kill me. Um, and I said that was good news. Uh, and I asked who they were going to kill and they said everybody except you and the patrol officer. So it was a, a little bit uh, frightening, but it reflected the way in which the two of us related to the Papuans in comparison with the colonial type coffee growers and other people who related in a, uh, a much more authoritarian and nasty manner. Uh, I stayed in New Guinea for a year and uh, I did do the two caesarean sections. Um, I lost a lot of sweat because I also had to do the anaesthetics. And I did manage uh, to get the child's spleen out and the child lived. And one of the problems is that if there's no one else to do something, you have to do it. And after you've done it a few times and everyone lives, you become a bit overconfident. And you start doing things that you really shouldn't be doing. So that's one of the lessons I quickly learned. Um, I then went... Uh, left New Guinea uh, on a boat. Um, I was up in Rabaul giving anaesthetics for a surgeon and I was trying to get to West Papua which um, I couldn't get to, the Indonesians wouldn't let me in. Uh, so there was this boat and it was a Japanese boat and they had two very sick uh, uh, crew and they wanted to take them, they wanted a doctor to take them back to Tokyo. So I went and uh, on the way uh, one of the patients died it's not a brilliant photo but I uh, had to share the cabin with this um, man who died and when I got to Japan I had to pay obeisance to his family he died of cancer of the stomach um, but it's not pleasant sharing a cabin with somebody who's not alive um, especially when it takes a long time to go through the tropics and get to Japan. Uh, I was a young bloke then, I was 27 years old and uh, quite thin. Uh, but I had a beard and the Japanese uh, treated me with a certain degree of, uh, of veneration and I couldn't understand this at all. <coughs> Uh, I got myself a job in the paediatric hospital in Tokyo. Uh, there were 40 doctors and 20 patients. <coughs> and uh, I wrote back to Perth to um, um, one of my mentors, Professor Joski, telling him about my newfound job. And he wrote back and said, um, and which half of the patient are you treating? And I met some uh, people whose... Uh, uh, actions in life were somewhat more liberal than mine had been so it was a bit of an education uh, while I was there uh, I got a letter saying that uh, they were desperate for a doctor in South Korea in Pusan with the Save the Children Fund and this came about through somebody telling somebody else that I happened to be there so um, they made me an offer of £12 a month and accommodation, uh, which made me quite wealthy in Korea at the time. And I went there, and we uh, saw absolute poverty at that time in South Korea. Uh, this was <coughs> 1963. And the, um, the level of poverty, the diseases we saw, uh, we saw typhoid, tuberculosis, uh, we used to, there were two doctors, myself and a South Korean, and we used to, 900 people would turn up every morning, and we had some nurses, and the nurses would sort of go along the like army style, and they would, they would cull the, the group so that we finished up seeing about 100 people each. Um, and then in the evening, one had to try to do surgery on people who needed it. 
I noticed that the other doctor was the South Korean doctor was very good at orthopaedic surgery and he was hopeless at anything that had to do with medicine like diabetes and <clears throat> after I got to know him better I went out and plied him with alcohol and said um, you're, you're not a medical graduate are you and he said no um, <clears throat> And he had uh, he'd gone to Japan to be a medical student, um, and he'd, he'd got three and a half years through his six-year course when um, the Japanese invaded uh, South Korea, and there was a war, and uh, he never finished his degree. Uh, he was adequate, and I never ratted on him. He was far better than nothing. Uh, this is the sort of thing that one saw it was um, uh, pretty heart wrenching uh, they then made me an offer to do locums for the Save the Children Fund and one of the locums was in South, was going to be in Jordan and uh, uh, I was a bit worried about that and I wanted a letter from the Anglican bishop saying I was a good Anglican <clears throat> and since I wasn't um, I was Jewish he, um, <coughs> uh, he declined to give me one uh, which I thought was very unchristian of him <laughs> so um, uh, I pinched some of his writing paper and wrote my own um, uh, after I'd been working in uh, Korea, came the, the the doctor who'd been the regular doctor came back, and it was time for me to to uh, move on. And I went to the wharf, and uh, I walked along the wharf, and I saw various sailors. And I said, "You want a doctor to go to Hong Kong?" And uh, the second boat I asked said, "Yes." So I got on the boat, and uh, <coughs> took me to Hong Kong. And then after Hong Kong I went to Malaysia where I knew various people. Uh, that was a classmate of mine. Uh, that was at a later date. Um, <clears throat> and then I went up through India and I got myself a job in Patna. And this was through, uh, this is North India. And this was through an acquaintance that I had. And the man was a surgeon. <coughs> And he complained about his patients. He said the A-class patients, the private patients, they're okay. And the C-class patients, the charity patients, they're okay. He doesn't charge them. But the B-class, the bureaucrats, they, they cause him a lot of trouble. And he said, I'll show you how I deal with these people. <clears throat> so he had a patient and he'd done a cholecystectomy. And uh, he said, um, you, go, you go out with the nurse and don't wash your hands and so we went out and the nurse all the relatives are outside the, the theatre and um, <clears throat> the nurse said um, uh, Dr Krishnamurti says that he has successfully completed the operation but until you pay the extra 20% he is not going to stitch up the patient <laughs> and um, and they, they paid the extra 20% but uh, <laughs> I didn't bring that back to Western Australia because I didn't think it was appropriate here. Uh, after that I moved on, I managed to get a visa to go to Nepal. Uh, at the time, Nepal had a population of 9 million people. Uh, it had 7 doctors, I made the 8th doctor. Uh, my intention was not to stay in Nepal uh, because I only had that one week visa. Uh, it was the only day sickness that I had in my travels and I had gastroenteritis which I knew I was going to get because it was a matter of dying of dehydration or drinking the, uh, the water that came in blue bottles with a marble on the top that also contained a whole lot of flies. Uh, and while I was feeling very sorry for myself, uh, this nurse had travelled from Simla and she told me that all the Tibetans had uh, berry berry so I went round asking and I was told that wasn't the case um, the seventh doctor who was a Swiss Red Cross doctor 
whose only interest in life was doing his PhD and he was doing the PhD in tuberculosis at the sacroiliac joint and he'd managed to find nine cases. Um, and he was pretty hopeless as a doctor apart from um, maybe that. Uh, so I went to Nepal um, and there were two and a half thousand Tibetan refugees there and they lived in that sort of circumstance. And uh, I made a deal with the Swiss Red Cross that uh, they would get me a visa and I would stay until the beriberi was finished. Uh, this small child on the left-hand side, Anjun, uh, adopted me and I was a bit wary because he was covered in scabies. <coughs> uh, but I got the benzyl benzoate, which was the treatment at the time, and smeared it all over him. And I didn't know that, uh, that it stung. I'd never actually ever used it before. And it stings quite a lot. And he ran away and uh, six days later he returned. Um, and he lived with me in one of those under one of those mats for um, about three months and then there was an outbreak of diphtheria and 17 kids got diphtheria and he was one of them and the lamas declared that the time was not propitious to treat the diphtheria and I had I'd managed to source diphtheria antitoxin and as a result of that the um, all 17 of them died it's not a nice way to die uh, and um, I'm not a very violent man but I got very cross and marched into the prayer tent and picked up the head lama and hid him and there were 2,500 of them and one of me so it's not a, not a very useful thing to do but they're very they're good Buddhists and so they didn't fight back uh, <clears throat> but they didn't talk to me for, for a long time and um, so I stayed there for six months um, got locked up for picking the Queen Mother's mangoes and met this fairly amazing person and that's what you do on your trips this, this is a guy called Boris Lasanovich. Uh he was one of the two resident, uh, um, resident Europeans the other was a Father Moran, a Jesuit uh, believe it or not, this guy was um, <coughs> a principal ballet dancer with the Diaghilev Ballet in uh, the famous Diaghilev Ballet. Um, and he then settled in Nepal. Um, bred pigs had the uh, monopoly of alcohol uh, and the only grand piano in Nepal. Uh, so after that, I made my way through... Um, Pakistan where I had friends and then all this was done by bus and uh, uh, through Afghanistan and one of these little buses uh, I actually was inside not on top and uh, I always carried with me one vial of morphine and one vial of pethidine and one vial of adrenaline uh, just in case uh, I needed it in an emergency and when I got to the border, they would say anything to declare, and I would say pethidine, morphine, and adrenaline. And they would laugh and let me through. <laughs> and that's a measure of how much things have changed. Uh, one of the things I, um, I did in Kabul was um, I went and played tennis, and I, as a result of that, I finished up as the tennis coach to the Afghan Davis Cup team. Uh, as you go through Afghanistan, you see little kiddies of this age, and they're called to prayer. And you think that um, that's a form of brainwashing, uh, and you wonder, you know, what hope there is for the world. Uh, I made my way through to Jordan where I did a locum for the Save the Children Fund and one of my jobs was to, to go to Petra. Uh, once a month I had to go to Petra and I also had to collect water from the Jordan River which was bottled and sold at 10 pounds a, um, a little bottle and that made money for the Save the Children Fund. At the time Petra had 
only a population of eight people and it had a little Save the Children Fund clinic. Um, I found that people were digging in Hebron, uh, archaeologists, and said, look, I'm a doctor and I'm interested in archaeology, and they said, oh, fantastic. And so I stayed with them for six weeks while they while they dug. This, uh, this was a crowd from um, Princeton University. And that's the Wailing Wall um, when it was in the hands of the Jordanians and later when it was in the hands of the Israelis. And then uh, <coughs> there was an uh, excavation going on uh, in Masada in Israel and they were looking for diggers. So I wrote them a letter and said, I'm an Australian digger and, uh, and I'm a doctor. And... Uh, the boss Yigal Yardin rang me and said we're desperate for a doctor and so I spent um, I spent the digging season as the doctor to this it's a very iconic place it's uh, it's where uh, the Romans uh, laid siege to the zealots and there were 903 zealots um, and rather than being captured they all committed suicide and that's King Herod's part of his palace. And then I made my way to Northern Ireland. Um, <coughs> and I made my way to England. And when I got to England, I couldn't get a job. And I don't think that would happen now. I couldn't get a job because they regarded me as being unstable. And... Uh, <coughs> And when I actually uh, buttonholed one of the guys who wouldn't give me a job, he said, oh, you've been here, there and everywhere. If I'll give you a job next week, you'll be somewhere else. And I said, that's unfair because there is no job that I haven't completed my contract. Uh, but eventually I got a job and after I got the job, uh, things became OK and everything sort of settled down. And I think that sort of, um, that feeling that, people had then that if you stepped off the ladder of promotion uh, you were finished. I think now nowadays it's a bit different. If you don't step off the ladder of promotion you're probably finished. So I think that one of the one of the things to do is to go and do something that's a bit out of the ordinary and I think that that not only helps your medical career but I think it will be seen by the people who give you jobs to help your career. Um, I stayed, we stayed in England for four and a half years uh, with pretty good years uh, I found the exams in England fairly easy and uh, <clears throat> came back through Madagascar uh, where there's not too many doctors but lots of, um, lots of herbalists and I came back from the Royal Postgraduate Hospital in London uh, to the back of Burke in New South Wales the fascinating thing was for me was that <clears throat> I reckoned I could practice medicine at about 85% of the level that I could practice it in the Royal Postgraduate Hospital in London, which is arguably probably one of the two best hospitals in the world. Um, you just need a bit of clinical nous and you need to do things. You don't need all of the investigations. You don't need all of the MRIs and the CT scans you actually can learn to practice clinical medicine at a very high level. Um, that was the first child in Burke. Uh, the conditions in Burke were very much fourth world. That was the Burke Reserve. Um, <clears throat> there was no running water, no sewage. This is in Australia in 1970. This is the only tap that served three, 200 people, 210 people. Um, while I was there, Mother Teresa's um, Mother Teresa turned up, <coughs> and Mother Teresa's nurse uh, nuns turned up, uh, and uh, they quickly. Um, I, I used to work with them two half days a week, and we used to get on pretty well. And then, um, after I'd started a family planning clinic for Aboriginal women. Um, our relationship sort of ceased uh, <clears throat> there was 
plenty of trachoma. There was an eye doctor who visited twice a year who said there was no trachoma. Um, I said he was a nutter, but it turned out that he only saw private patients, so he never saw any Aboriginal patients. And that led me to go to Sydney looking for an eye doctor, and uh, someone said there's a mad person down there, Fred Hollows. So I went and saw Fred Hollows, and that's where Fred Hollows started with um, the eye campaign. So he came to Burke, did everything wrong, learnt as he went, um, did an experiment in a little place near Burke called Engonia, and then decided he would eradicate trachoma uh, in Australia. Uh, some of the things that you saw there are pretty unusual. Um, and Burke is a prime citrus growing area. Here's a child with multivitamin deficiencies. Um, you can see that this, or you, you might be able to see in this child and his teeth down the bottom, they're bleeding. He's got bleeding gums. Uh, this is a younger child with scurvy, with heaped up bleeding gums. A baby with scurvy, they don't move, they just lie there because they've got periosteal hemorrhaging and it's very painful. Um, there were people with leprosy there and that's a medical student and <clears throat> I guess that this medical student was probably the first medical student of the rural clinical school um, because I, I had students regularly there and they came for six weeks and this guy really impressed me because at the end of it he said um he said, you, you don't have too many answers, he said, but thank you for introducing me to the questions. And I guess that that's one of the things that you're trying to do um, with this group here. Um, I learned about drought and what it does to farmers. Uh, after that, I went up... Um, where Jenny probably works in Owen Pelly, and I was part of a I was asked to be part of a team that monitored the impact of uranium mining on Aboriginal people. And that was a five year project. Um, interesting at the time the Aboriginal people um, at the beginning they didn't want ur uranium mining and at the end they got so many benefits from it that they wanted it, now their children don't want it. And um, I do regular locums up in um, Kununurra. Um, that was outside where I lived. Uh, then <clears throat> uh, in 1979, Professor Saint, who was um, the first professor of medicine, uh, invited me to go to uh, to uh, China with him. Um, this was at the end of the Cultural Revolution. It was pretty interesting stuff. And we turned up with a lot of money from Australian aid. Um, were met at, we never went through customs. We were met at the plane by a car that took us away. And uh, seven years later, we stopped the... or the Australian Development Assistance stopped the money and there was no car and uh, plenty of customs. Uh, great interest in 79 was acupuncture and acupuncture anaesthesia. And uh, other places that I've been in um, uh, at the end of 1999, uh, Australian uh, Development Assistance rang and asked me if I would go to, uh, to East Timor. And so I've been going to East Timor every year since then. Uh, that's the famous Santa Cruz, or infamous Santa Cruz Cemetery where there was the massacre. Uh, plenty of tuberculosis. It's uh, got the highest incidence of tuberculosis in the world. And you see the effects of tuberculosis, the um, tuberculosis of the spine in this, um, in this child. Uh, that's a man called Dan Murphy. If you haven't heard of Dan Murphy, you will hear of Dan Murphy. Uh, Dan Murphy's an American doctor who's made uh, 
his team or his life and his cause uh, he was the last person to leave East Timor oh he got thrown out of East Timor by the Indonesians and he went off and saw Bill Clinton and Bill Clinton sort of said uh, you've got to let him back otherwise we're cutting aid to Indonesia so they let him back he was the last person out with the invasion and he was the first person back and he's there um, he lives with a um, East Timorese nun he's got contacts everywhere and uh, he's set up an amazing service full of medical students uh, the, the last place I go to, went to was up in the mountains uh, they have no running water, no electricity a purely subsistence economy on corn um, interpreter set up in one of the huts saw about 100 people a day and I was 69 at the time and this man was 69 too uh, you can see that there's a difference in the state of nutrition uh, it's very difficult to run a clinic because, with any privacy because people hang around and look and uh, that was my living quarters beautiful place um, this lady had broken her arm and she had a small child and a helicopter came to pick me up and the helicopter refused to take her um, the baby and her husband and one had to go to all kinds of stratagems I pretended to talk on the, radio, the helicopter radio to um, Janana Guzmao, the, um, who was at this, that time the president, and I told the guy that wouldn't let me on the plane that he was in for big, big trouble, and uh, he didn't know what to do, so he let me on the plane and with all these people. And that's Guzmao's wife, uh, an Australian lady of heroic proportions. Um, got involved with the uh, Paralympics one of my patients from day one won a gold medal it was quite an event uh, nearly finished Jakarta Declaration the determinants of health it's fine to have determinants uh, 1984 World Health Organization said health for all by the year 2000 hasn't happened um, other things you can do with your medical passport medical degree passport is you can go off to Antarctica as a ship's doctor uh, this man Andrew Locke was one of the guides uh, he's one of nine people in the whole world that has climbed uh, <coughs> every single mountain over 8,000 metres virtually unknown in Australia but he should be better known than most of the Olympic athletes um, Archibald Prize winner who came on one of the trips a wife who came on one of the trips uh, the man on the right um, was, a, was a pain in the ass, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> uh, and he was the only one who didn't leave his email address when people don't do that either they're criminals or else they're above it and he was or had there not been a French Revolution he would be the King of France he's a direct descendant of um, uh, Louis Napoleon South Georgia with the story of Shackleton and Shackleton's grave one of my heroes was uh, the doctor on Shackleton's expedition um, and he did some fairly heroic things and wrote a wonderful treatise in scurvy and if you're going to be a doctor that goes to various places it's more important to be ingenious than to be a genius and some aphorisms do your homework before you go um, don't go for a week stay, stay as long as you can 
uh, integrate. If you've got a skill, be it sport, music, or what have you, go and use it. Uh, I've found tennis to be an enormous passport. Uh, don't don't take a lot of luggage; it clutters you down. Um, find out about the culture, and don't be shy. Just don't be shy. Leave leave your inhibitions at home. If you're frightened to go and talk to someone, go and talk to them. And if you go and talk to them, a whole lot of things open up. You find out that a boat's going. You find out that an aeroplane's going. You find out things about the population. Um, Say thank you to people and keep in touch with them. They like it. And keep a diary because when you get into your 70s, Uh, you won't remember what you did in your 20s and 30s. Uh, One of the nice things about this is I pulled out a diary. I don't think I'd ever pulled that diary out since 19, maybe 1970. And I had a a little read through it. Um, So I thank you for making me do that. So that's basically what what I did and how I did it. And uh, now in the internet it's a bit easier to do some of those things. But there's a great shortage of doctors um, and there's a great shortage of doctors with certain skills uh, and the main skill is the skill to be able to think. Uh, So I suggest it. It's it's an eye-opener. You can keep doing it. it. It puts a contrast between the sort of medicine that we have in Western Australia which is modern and out of control in some ways highly expensive highly litigious Uh, and you go to these places and you see something else and occasionally you do some good and I think that that's what medicine should be about